Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Grief During the Holidays, Tools to Cope with Loss. My name is Lauren Blair, and I'm the Provider and Community Relations Manager at Coastal Hospice. Welcome to our Caregiver Academy. We are excited that you're joining us today. Among our attendees today, we are happy to see so many familiar organizations with us. We have colleagues from Title Health, Mac Inc., Visiting Angels, Maryland Access Point, Worcester County Commission on Aging, among many others. It's wonderful to see you all today. I have the honor of moderating this webinar today, and I've invited three experts on grief to join us today. I want to take a few minutes to introduce to you our amazing panel. Alvin T. Harmon is the Bereavement Care Services Encompass Program Manager at Coastal Hospice. He is a grief recovery specialist. Alvin was educated by the College of Pastoral Supervision and Psychotherapy, interning as a part of palliative care teams within the University of Maryland and Anne Arundel Medical Center of Maryland. Simultaneously, he studied at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University with a focus on bioethics. Welcome, Alvin. Christina puig Bugo is a bereavement counselor at Coastal Hospice. Christina has over 20 years of experience working with the bereaved, deaf, and dying. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Puerto Rico. She completed a master's of science degree in pastoral counseling at Leola College in Columbia and has completed four units of clinical pastoral education at Riverside Regional Medical Center. During her studies, she completed two counseling internships, one at the College of Notre Dame Counseling Center and the other at Hospice of Chesapeake. She graduated with a Master's of Arts degree in Theological Studies from Washington Theological Union in Washington, DC. Christina has completed her certificate in Palliative Care Chaplaincy from California State University and Companioning the Dying Program in DC. Welcome, Christina. Reverend Howard F. Travers Jr. is a bereavement counselor at Coastal Hospice and is a native of Salisbury, Maryland. He received his ministry ordination in 1982. He holds a Master of Theology and a Master of Divinity from Southwestern Assemblies of God University in Waxahachie, Texas, and has earned five units of clinical pastoral education. He received certification as a hospice and palliative care chaplain from California State University and is a certified thanatologist, having achieved specific education background in dying, death, and bereavement combined with experience in the field. Howard Travers has worked as a chaplain and bereavement counselor for Coastal Hospice for the past 28 years. Welcome, Howard. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you all. We're excited for you to be here with us. Alvin, will you tell us about what we're going to be discussing today? Sure, Lauren. So one of the things we're going to be dealing with today is the many emotions that you might be faced with during the holidays. Um, also, we want to allow you to have some opportunity to consider traditions and, and other coming changes, some things that you might not have expected. Um, we're going to give you some real practical tips on how to survive social events, um, as well as how to discover or rediscover your hope for the future. Can't wait to get started. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alvin. Sounds great. Love and hope. Christina, will you share this poem with us? Yes, thank you, Lauren. Uh, it's titled Love and Hope by Carrie Marston in memory of her son. On a cold winter day, the sun went out. Grief walked in to stay. I turned away from the unwanted guest and bid him be on his way. Grief was merciless. He brought his friends, loneliness, fear, and despair. They walked these rooms unceasingly in the somber cloaks they wear. Every so often now, love pays a call. She always has hope by her side. I welcome love as well as hope, for I thought surely they had died. Love counsels grief in a most gentle way, bids him be still for a while. Then love walks with me through memory's hall, and for a time I can smile. That poem is very powerful, Christina. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And, and Laura and I chose this poem because I think we could all relate to the feelings that were mentioned, loneliness, fear, despair, as well as hope and love. 
See, for those who are grieving the death of a loved one, special days such as holidays, birthdays, and anniversaries can be very difficult. For some of us, holidays are a special time to gather with loved ones to share a meal, play games, tell stories, watch a movie, laugh, and connect with one another. When someone we love dies, their absence is deeply felt during this time. So during the holidays, feelings of sadness, loneliness might intensify. When we gather with loved ones, not talking about our loss or pretending we don't hurt is not helpful. We can acknowledge our loss in ways that would be comforting for everyone. Holidays can be enjoyable, but they will be different. I remember a young man who attended one of the Bremen support group, which I facilitated. He had just lost his daughter. One day he arrived to the group and just a fear physically and emotionally upset. He just had like a fat, uh, sad affect and was kind of bent over a little bit as if he was carrying a heavy burden. He shared with the group that he was struggling in anticipation of Father's Day. For him, it was a reminder that his daughter was no longer present or able to participate in family gatherings. The group members listened and were very supportive of him. To my surprise, at the following session, he arrived and he was smiling and just appeared lighter. He shared that he decided to take his family to the lake for Father's Day weekend. At one point during the weekend, he decided to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with his son. During the conversation, his son said something like, Dad, we have to be grateful that she was part of our lives. Those words seemed to comfort him and offered him a new perspective about the holiday. He said they had a wonderful weekend. I recall when my father died, a few months after his death, it was my birthday. And I was dreading the day because I realized that I would no longer be receiving a birthday card or a phone call from him. Not receiving them was a reminder that he was no longer with us. It just felt so final. I was also afraid of the pain, emptiness, and sadness that would arise. To my surprise, on that day, I received the birthday card from his wife. I do confess that I was comforted and I will be, be forever grateful. That's a beautiful story, Christina. Thank you for sharing those with us. So powerful. You're welcome, and thank you. And um, as I was thinking about these stories, some insights that came up for me. Um, so I would now would like to share with you some thoughts to ponder. Acknowledge your loss. Like I mentioned earlier, it is best not to pretend that the loss did not occur or that you're not hurting. As you gather with loved ones, one idea that might be helpful is lighting two candles, one for the person who died and the other for those who remain. Blow out one candle and explain that it represents the person that died, while the other candle represents those who continue despite of your pain and sorrow. Then you might wanna put the candles aside during the holiday gathering, acknowledging the loss yet aware that life goes on. Talk with trusted family members or friends who will listen. Some people might mean well, but they can make comments that are not helpful. If your heart does not feel like it's safe talking with a particular person, you might wanna limit your time or avoid interacting with them for a while. Verbalize your needs. Make sure that you're clear about what your needs are. For example, if you need someone just to listen, tell them. Say something like, I just need you to listen right now. Sometimes we're not aware or clear about what our needs are. So take some time apart and ask yourself, what would it be helpful to me right now? Journaling might be one way to find out. Name your fear. For me, it was the fear of the emotional pain that the day would cause, like, sadness and emptiness. Also, it was the fear of facing the reality of my dad's death, because like I said, it felt so final. See, life as I knew it had changed. 
So it was the fear of facing that reality. Be honest and authentic. The pain of loss has the potential to transform us. So be aligned with who you are becoming. For example, maybe you were the life of the party and now you don't feel like being that. It's okay to be different. These are wonderful thoughts, Christina. Thank you. You talked about having a trusted person to talk to. What if I don't feel like I have a trusted person I can talk to? That's a good question, Lauren. I, I would suggest journaling. That's one way to, to just kind of get your feelings out, your thoughts out on paper. You might also want to talk out loud to yourself or your loved one. That might be another option. So on our next slide, we have be open to surprise. For this young man, it was his son's comment that changed his whole perspective and attitude about the holiday. For me, it was receiving a birthday card from my dad's wife. Be open to see a situation from another perspective. At times, we have our own thoughts and perspective about a situation and cannot see beyond it. Be flexible. You have a choice. Look for the good. It's so easy to focus on what we lost that we could not see the good around us. So be attentive to your surroundings. I will share with you a story of a hospice patient who I visited. Upon my arrival, he was sitting in a recliner chair with his, his eyes closed. Softly, I said his name just in case he was sleeping. I didn't want to wake him up. Immediately, he sat up. He gave me a big smile and invited me to come in. He proceeded to say, tell me something good. I do confess that those words challenged me because at that moment, there was nothing good that I could think of. This patient was blind, no longer able to walk and facing his death. Yet his spirit was joyful as he sought the good around him. On that day, he taught me to look for the good in the midst of difficulties. Be willing to be comforted in ways that you did not anticipate. Let go, relax, and allow the situation to evolve as it may. Ask yourself, what will comfort me? You might mean join, not joining a gathering or in spending time to yourself. These are great tools for our holiday toolbox, thank you. Could you say more about being open to surprise? Sure, I, um, by being able to open to surprise, I mean to kind of have an inward disposition of an openness, willingness to receive. Um, for example, I'm thinking of a person who shared with me, she had lost both father two years ago and son recently. And uh, fa her father and her son were very close. Um, and one day she was sitting in her room, in her home, watching outside the window. And all of a sudden she saw two cardinals in one of the branches on the tree, which is kind of unusual because you usually see a male and a female, but in this occasion it was two males. And for her it was a reassurance that they were together. Um, and that's what I mean by being open to surprise, just open and willingness to receive. So thank you, Lauren, for that question. On the next slide, we have reach out to others who are grieving. In other ways, use your pain to help others in need. This one actually goes with our next one. Give meaning to your pain. You might consider doing volunteer work like feeding people who are homeless or invite others to your home who have nowhere to go for the holidays. You will survive. Remember that the anticipation of an event is more difficult than the event itself. Give yourself permission to feel your feelings as difficult as they may be. Be aware of the ways in which you're being comforted. Someone might give you a hug, a gentle touch, a smile, inspiring word. Maybe you see the beauty in nature, it might capture you like a beautiful sunset, sunrise, or rainbow. Think outside the box. What was comforting to you then might not be comforting to you now. Stay in the present moment and ask yourself, what will be helpful to me right now? 
On the next slide, we have plan a trip, the holiday. Might be an opportunity to do something different. Practice gratitude. Right, you might say, how can I be grateful? My loved one is no longer with me. I believe that gratitude grows. When we're willing and receptive to seek the good and practice gratitude, our attitude and disposition changes. Vulnerability. Remember that grieving is a very vulnerable time. So you might be more sensitive and react differently to people, places, or things. Be gentle with yourself, beating yourself up because you said or didn't say or did or didn't do, it's not helpful. It just brings you further down. Breathe, just remember to breathe. Be aware of your feelings. If you're encountering a difficult situation, tell, your, tell yourself inwardly, stop and take a deep breath. You'll be amazed how that small step can make a big difference. No matter our circumstances, experiencing grief during the holidays can be very difficult because it challenges us in so many different ways. In summary, at the beginning, I started by reading a poem that reminded us that there is goodness in the midst of sadness, that both joy and grief have the potential to coexist. Like this young man, it is important to be open, receptive, and willing to view a situation from another perspective. Keep in mind that the anticipation of an event is, has the potential to be more difficult than the event itself. If the holidays are a pa painful time for you, be open to the pain because it has the potential to transform you. Find ways to take care of yourself in the process. You have choices. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Christina. They are, these are wonderful tips and strategies for us to have. Thank you for your insight. And as a reminder to our audience, feel free to type your questions in the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Christina. I would like to welcome Alvin now. Alvin, welcome. Talk to us about receiving the invitation. Hey, thank you, Lauren, for that introduction. And, and thank you, Christina, for the wonderful information that you've just provided. Uh, I'm so honored to be uh, sharing this panel with the esteemed members of our Coastal Hospice Bereavement Services Department. And again, I'd like to welcome all of our viewing audience. Uh, our intent here today is just to share with you some valuable tools that not will only help you cope with your loss, but will also help you get through this holiday season. So when we talk about receiving the invitation, I want you to just uh, imagine walking to your mailbox or checking your email. And, and as you open them, there's an invitation to a holiday gathering. Now, your first thought might be that of excitement, but quickly you feel the sudden and grounding reminder that you're, that you're grieving the loss of a loved one. Now, there are some of us who are experiencing our first holiday after the death of a loved one. And just receiving these invitations can cause some form of anxiety or stress. Uh, you might immediately begin to panic as you try to picture what you may have to endure while attending a gathering without your loved one. So as you envision the dramatic looks of pity and as you consider how many times you'll hear that dreaded question, how are you? Um, which is often followed by the equally overused, if there's anything that I can do, please let me know statement. See, many other thoughts might occur while you're trying to work through these feelings. These may include concerns about obligation, such as the value that you place on the person who's requesting your presence at an event. Is this person a well-loved family member, a respected community official, or maybe even a longtime friend? Determining the value of the relationship can often increase your sense of obligation to attend. You may also be thinking, this person has attended your events in the past, so now you feel compelled to attend theirs. Just remind yourself that you are grieving and previous events were not influenced by the same emotion you may be currently experiencing. There may also be anxiety surrounding judgment. What will people say about you if you don't show up? If it's a holiday office occasion, might there be any consequences if you don't show up? 
Also, you don't want the person you rejected to feel undervalued and upset, making them trust you less and hurting your relationship. Now, for the most part, no one likes to say no. And some of us, like me, just like it way more than others. So to help clear up uh, any thoughts in your process, first think about whether you want to go if any of these concerns were not present at all. Consider this, every time any person, organization, or entity endeavors to correspond with you through mail, calls, emails, text, direct messaging, even a knock on the door or a shout across the fence or any other medium, they are attempting to introduce their agenda to you. And no matter how urgent, innocent, accidental, or intentional, these are encroachments upon you and your time. This type of decision in and of itself can be stressful enough, but pile grief brain on top of that, and it can be a bit more complicated with longer term impacts, making it very easy to feel unsure or hesitant. Listen, we all would like to be able to know the outcome of a decision before we make it, but at the very minimum, you can know how to put some thorough thought into it. It's essential to learn positive approaches for making decisions in difficult situations. It is just as important to understand that indecision can have an adverse effect on how you're feeling as well. Thank you, Alvin. Something tells me in our next slide, you're going to talk about how we can make that decision. Yeah, absolutely. Making these decisions is so critical. So the question we need to ask ourselves is how do we even respond when we receive this type of invitation while we're grieving? The first thing you need to know is to take your time and weigh whether or not you want to go to the event at all. Resist the urge to rush your decisions without thinking them through. Oftentimes, as soon as we feel to see the decision, we feel the need to respond right away. And depending on how soon your loss occurred, it may be just too soon for you, and that's okay. You have the right to say, not this time, but gradually generating the courage to attend these types of events is healthy practice for your recovery. Knowing whether you want to attend will help you decide whether saying no to the invitation is appropriate. You may also feel pressure to respond within the time limit requested, but generally have no idea how you feel on the day of the event. To further explain that, I'm talking about like if you have an RSVP by a certain date, and maybe you feel okay right now, but just possibly on the day of the event, you might not be feeling as well. So some response options to consider are, could you please reserve my invitation? This communicates a plan to attend, but gives you an opportunity as a grieving individual to experience mood changes, which is normal grief response. Another option is to be truthful and say, you know, I have some days that are better than others, but for now, I'm gonna say yes. But I will absolutely let you know, but please understand this is a challenging process for me. Keep your responses honest. While it may be tempting to limit the awkwardness by making up fake plans, it could just land you in a spiral in which the person offers an alternative date or time, and now you have to think of more and more excuses. In fact, it may even make you feel like you eventually have to say yes to something you're uncomfortable with simply to cover your dishonesty. Overall, keep in mind that you simply may not be in a place to say yes to every holiday event that you're invited to. Here's some tips. Be positive. If you're considering declining a holiday event invitation, it doesn't have to sound negative. Start off your response on a positive note, like, hey, it's great to hear from you. And then end on a positive one too. Like, I definitely miss spending time with you. Also, if it's a text response, the use of emojis might help express your positive intentions. Make your response short and sweet. Since most of your circle already knows that you're grieving, creating a concise and polite response is as easy as, while I'd like to see you, I'm giving myself some additional space right now. You may feel like you need to give the person your detailed reasoning as to why you're saying no, but you absolutely don't. So how do you respond to those who say, I just don't know about my loved one. 
This is a very important question because not only do we grieve for the person we lost, but also for the life we lived with that person. We grieve the loss of how that person functioned in our lives as a companion. We remember all the things we did together, the games we played, the songs we sung, the parades we watched. We remember all of our traditions. Now there's a part of us who we, when we were together that is no longer living and our own identity is changing. Regarding the person you lost, now you are no longer a spouse, no longer a child, a sibling, a parent, or significant friend. The pain associated with these changes may be more evident during the holidays. And we can respond to these feelings of changes by being intentional about self-care, to take deliberate steps to discover what is unique about you, uncover what makes you different from everyone else, and begin a path to understanding your changing identity. There's no deadline, no expected time frame. Just be patient and kind with yourself. These are great considerations, Alvin. Thank you so much. It can be overwhelming to find ourselves after losing a loved one. How do you respond to those who say, I don't know who I am without my loved one? Yeah, you know, just being able to be kind to yourself, finding your identity, as I said, there may be some new projects, some things that you thought you might um, want to take on. Um, as for me, myself, after my, my, my father died, uh, one thing I always wanted to do was learn how to skydive. And I adopted that new thing and I just took it on, you know. So being able to kind of reinvent yourself or maybe look closely at some things that you really wanted to do is a good practice. Wonderful examples. Thank you, Alvin. In our next slide, Alvin's going to tell us more about being prepared if we do choose to attend events. Right. Okay. So you decided to undertake making an appearance to a party or drop by to visit someone during the holidays. How are you going to handle all of your uncomfortable interactions? Let's say someone does ask that dreaded question, how are you doing? It's good to have a preconceived idea how you might handle that question. Also, give thought to how you respond to probing questions. Questions I've heard asked of the bereaved like, how are you paying your bills? How did your husband die? Or more thoughtlessly connected to that last question, the statement someone gives of their how from the gossip they collected concerning the death of your loved one. It is a good practice to actually jot down some responses ahead of the event. Having a few things ready that you can respond to to each person who asks may prove to create a much more comfortable atmosphere in these settings. Know and create your boundaries. You are in control of how much you want to share. This is your process and you are doing the steering. And if we're not deliberate and intentional in choosing to what extent and the details of what we disclose, we might actually find ourselves in a position that can make us feel very uneasy. In this place, we can find ourselves sharing more than what we attended and possibly begin to feel forced to answer very uncomfortable questions. When someone asks you questions that you feel are intrusive in nature, Again, just simply be honest and say, thank you for your concern, but right now, I'd just rather not discuss it. I believe that there is some intrinsic value in sharing with you today that it is not rude, disrespectful, nor discourteous to let someone know that the death of your loved one is not a topic that you are willing to discuss, especially in this type of setting. What you can do after stating that you'd rather not talk about it it's changed the emphasis of the conversation by switching the subject to a topic in which that person might be interested. An example might sound like, hey, did you make your famous sweet potato pie this year? I like that thought of changing the subject. Great idea, Alvin. Great idea. I have a question from the chat box from Linda Clark. Linda asks, how can I feel happy during the holidays if I no longer have my partner to share it with? Yeah, I, I get that. That that sounds like a bit of an absurd, absurd idea. Happiness while you're grieving. Uh, I mean, the holidays are supposed to be fun and full of joy, but grief throws a, a darkness over this season by blackening the happy memories of the festivities, festivities we've had in the past. So here's some food for thought. We grieve because we cherished. 
we feel sad because we held close. We made a conscious decision to develop a passionate, powerful attachment to another human being. We permitted an individual to have a deep, intimate space in our life, and we gave ourselves permission to become vulnerable to those connections. That which we used to build a safe life as one, death has now shattered. The simple truth is you can do both. It is absolutely okay to take a break from your grief. And it's also okay to feel things like joy and happiness. Experiencing positive emotions does not mean that you're not also grieving. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you so much for your expertise on this topic. Loved having you here today. Thank you, Lauren. And now I'd like to welcome Howard. Howard, thank you for being here with us. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Appreciate the invite. So some of the questions that may go along with uh, this holiday season, um, they may seem endless. How am I going to get through the next few weeks? Should I just ignore the holidays this year? Uh, there's often the question of a timeline. How long am I going to feel this way? Should I just try and suppress my true feelings in order not to ruin the holidays for others? Um, should I, should we as a family perhaps even change our holiday traditions? Th these are just a few of the, the many questions that people ask, particularly this time of year. There really are a lot of questions that surface when, when we're talking about grieving during the holidays. Absolutely. How should I respond if I'm attending a holiday event and my grief surfaces? Is it appropriate for me to remain at the event or do I excuse myself? What's the appropriate yeah, that's a great question, Lauren. Um, and, and it really truly depends upon the individual and how comfortable they feel um, with expressing their emotions or not expressing their emotions. And as Alvin said, it's it's perfectly fine uh, to excuse yourself uh, from the gathering, uh, particularly if you feel that your grief or emotions are becoming too overwhelming in that moment. Um, or, or to remain and just to uh, give some explanation as to how you're feeling. And so um, I, it depends on each individual and how they handle that. But absolutely, as uh, Christina said, to feel those emotions is the most important. Great advice, Howard. Thank you. Let's talk in our next slide about what to do when we have suffered a loss. Sure, I'm gonna combine actually the, uh, the first two points because I think they're relevant to each other. Um, don't merely handle your feelings, feel them, and you can only heal if you truly express your feelings. And so, Rather than uh, deny or in some way feel victimized by your feelings, learn to, to recognize and learn from them. I think Christina said that so well. I often quote one of our country's um, leading death experts, Dr. Alan Wolfert, who says that you should always be willing to look your grief in the face and say hello to that. And I think that's so important in being able to recognize your feelings and in many ways embrace your pain. Um, seldom, I'm sorry, seldom is this loss only this loss for you because death does have a, a ripple effect. Uh, I'd be willing to bet that the death of uh, your loved one has impacted at least one other person in your life, uh, some other family member, a, a friend, a colleague, a coworker, a neighbor. So rarely is your loved one's death only impacting you. There's someone else that's being impacted by uh, this death also. The only person who can best care for you is you. So let's face it, you know, grief can be raw, it can be painful, it can be messy. And it's important during times of grief to take care of yourself. Um, Self-care is a crucial part of this entire healing process. And as every individual's grief is unique, so also is their pathway to that healing. And so what works for someone else may not work for you, and, and that's okay. Just find what self-care does work for you and learn to be kind to yourself. In addition to being raw and painful and messy, gr grief can also be cruel. And so knowing that, give yourself the love, give yourself the respect that you deserve. I'm also going to uh, combine the other two points here because I think they too are relevant to each other um, in allowing others to help you help them too. And try and show grace with those who try to give you care. Um, back to what I stated earlier in that seldom is this loss only a loss for you. If someone 
offers to be of help, if they offer to be of assistance to you in some kind way, then allow them to do so, uh, even if it's in uh, some defined or limited way. Uh, allowing that person to help you also helps provide some nourishment, some help for their own soul during this time. So grant them that opportunity, even if it's permission, as I said, in, in just a limited or defined way. Give them, give them the benefit of the doubt in that moment that they truly mean well. They only want to help because there is perhaps some drop of water that they're in need of in return for uh, their own thirsty soul. Uh, sometimes it makes perfect sense to act a little crazy. Um, many bereaved persons tell me how crazy uh, they feel at times while grieving the loss of their loved one. Um, you may forget things. Sometimes you may drive your vehicle as if you're on autopilot. Uh, you stare at the papers on your desk. You may feel paralyzed to get any work done. One woman said to me recently through her tears, just please tell me that what I'm experiencing and what I'm going through right now is normal. Um, I'm not going crazy. Um, and the resounding answer is, you know, despite how this season in your life feels to you right now, it's perfectly normal to, to feel this way. And so therefore, since you feel this way, sometimes it makes sense that your actions are perhaps a little out of character. Now, let me clarify that. That's that's not a, a license to commit an act in violation of the law or to in some way violate your, your moral compass. It, it's just having the understanding and the grace with yourself to not always be yourself and, and perhaps to act in a way that may seem out of the ordinary or or crazy, if you will, to others, but they make perfect sense to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Again, I'm, I'm going to combine the next two points, uh, Lauren, because uh, of the relatedness also. You do have a choice in how you respond to your loss. Um, your, your grieving, your timing, and, and progress are yours alone, and, and that's how it should be. Uh, your grief journey is shaped by many factors, including the nature of uh, your relationship with your loved one, the circumstances that are associated with your loved one's death, um, the age of your loved one who died. These are just some of the many factors that can impact your grieving. And, and so you do have a choice, and that choice remains uniquely yours in how you respond or perhaps choose not to respond um, to your loss. This time can be one of soul making unlike any other. You know, each of us has a soul and that cons soul consists of your mind, your will and your emotions. And, and when your heart is broken and you're grieving, it's your soul that initiates the thoughts, the feelings, the, the, the inward desires that you hear and feel during this time. And grief calls, it, it calls from your soul for you to make time for healing, to make time for transformation. And, and it's during this time that your soul just cries out for your attention so that you can heal, so that you can move on to peace and joy again in your life. Uh, not all your questions will have answers, but they certainly are worth asking. And, and some of the more common questions many people in grief ask include, how long is this going to last? Um, when will this all be over for me? When will I ever stop crying? That's a familiar question that so many ask. Is this normal? Is it normal to feel angry? Is it normal to feel angry with my loved one? Is it normal even to feel angry with, with, uh, with God? H how do I pick up the pieces? How do I go on from here? And what should I be doing right now? Um, not all of your questions will have answers, but there is some real value in asking them. And your time of loss can also be one of discovery, and I think it can also be one of rediscovery as well. And so utilize this time to discover new things about your loved one, uh, new things about yourself, new things about others. It may be the rediscovery of a long forgotten talent and ability, or even something new that you never thought you could do previously. Uh, the important thing is to not allow this season in your life to, to be the end, but rather allow it to be a new beginning for you. 
Thank you, Howard. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What holiday measures are recommended for a care provider who's anticipating having a loss? That's a great question, Lauren. And um, we commonly refer to that as anticipatory grief. It is the feelings of those grief emotions um, that occur prior to or um, impending a loved one's death. And so I think it's important um, to have those conversations, if possible, um, with the person um, who is dying uh, to see perhaps what their wishes are. Um, it may be that they may want to celebrate the holidays earlier than usual. Um, uh, it may be that they want to, to see the Christmas tree up and the stockings and the lights and so forth and exchanging presents and gifts. Um, and I think those conversations are important too uh, with the family and, um, and, and what are the needs of the family during that time. It, it's not unusual to, to celebrate the holidays much, much earlier in anticipation of a loved one's passing. Um, and so I think those important conversations uh, should, should take place. And, and remember that it's the celebration and, and the recognition of the traditions that's the most important rather than the date that may be assigned to those things. So yeah, great yeah. question. I think, I think that's great. That's wonderful. Celebrating early. Why not? Yeah. yeah that's wonderful. That's a great segue into our next slide. Remembering our loved one. Tell us about the four R's. So the four R's, I think it's um, important, number one, and at the top of the list, I've put relax, um, because I think it's important to pace yourself. Um, as Christina said, most often concerns about the holidays are, are worse than the holidays actually are. So take a step back, take those necessary and needed breaks, uh, both from morning as, as well as from the other activities that you used to engage in this time of year. Um, engage in self-care, as I already said, and uh, just breathe, as Alvin said as well. Um, and reorient. Um, it's important to acknowledge first and foremost that things are not going to be the same this year as they were last year or, or even in comparison to previous years. So I think it's important to start right there. Um, and if it's organizationally or visually helpful for you, you, you may want to write out uh, the specific things that are going to be different uh, about the holiday season this year. Uh, give yourself the time, give yourself the space to, to take that inventory, if you will, saying, um, I did that thing last year, and so that may very well be the last time that I can do that thing in that particular way. And then once you've laid the landscape and have taken inventory of all the things that you've done in the past around this time, then allow that inner compass, if you will, to, to guide you in asking, okay, so now what? of all the tasks, of all the activities, what feels most right for me to do now? Are there things that I wanna keep the same? Are there things that I wanna change? And then what things do I not need to do this year? Uh, what are those things about the holidays that are less important to me right now? What are those things about the holidays this year that feel less meaningful uh, to me that I can set aside? What do I need to give myself permission to do this year or not to do? And what might be helpful uh, to hear from your family that you can have permission not to do this year in order to respect their physical and emotional limits? And that may include limiting the number of engagements that you're involved in this year, as Alvin said, or, or maybe you're going to send less cards this year. Or maybe not. Maybe you're going to change how you used to invest more energy uh, in, in socializing. And perhaps this year you're going to spend more time uh, socializing, more time sending personal handwritten cards and letters to your family, to your friends and others. So maybe there's a stocking missing this year. Maybe there isn't. Uh, what are some of the things that, that you're going to keep the same? And then in that same vein, what are some things that are going to change this year. Uh, and the bottom line is, and I think our panelists have said this well already, do what feels right to you and in considering the other players in your life. What do you need to communicate to them about your needs this year? What are some of the conversations that you need to have with them about what their needs are as they grieve this loss too? Uh, what are they concerned about? 
Uh, what would they like to keep the same? What are some things that they would like to change? Perhaps there's, there's some compromising or, or negotiating uh, that needs to happen uh, within your family or within your circle of support. I'm, I'm thinking of a, of a family in particular. They, they engaged in a, a very long discussion centered around whether or not to, to put up the Christmas tree following the death of one of their children. And, and there were some in the family who saw the Christmas tree as an important tribute to their son and brother who had died. Other families felt that doing so was disrespectful. And so the family was, was able to sit down and they were able to, to talk through each other's point of view um, and hear each other out um, and making a decision that felt right for everyone. And I think that's so important. Um, rely, well, what supports have, have been working for you? You may have family or friends who are great listeners who you can spend time with, who you can connect with, um, who can hear you, who can be present with you uh, in your grief. Perhaps you feel the need to gravitate towards someone else um, with whom you can share craft ideas with or, or great holiday recipes with or someone with whom you can go on long uh, bird watching walks with or someone who's just fun to be around, just someone fun to socialize with. So be thoughtful, be intentional about broadening your grief social support network in, in order to meet the different needs uh, that you have. Maybe you just wanna take a break from relationships this holiday season or not. Maybe you're feeling dependent uh, that you need to spend more time this holiday season with others. And exploring what that looks like for you and, and how you are assessing those supports. If those individuals live away outside the area, uh, how will you connect with them? And, and, and then making a plan around that. And then lastly of all, uh, to remember, how do you maintain the relationship with that loved one who has died, though that person is not physically present this year? Uh, what is still true about that relationship? And how do you foster and maintain connections with that person in, in new ways or in different ways or in similar ways that are just adapted? Um, I think a great book uh, by Robert Neumeyer is uh, Continuing Bonds that I would recommend uh, to our viewers today. It, it helps to assist you in fostering and maintaining the connections uh, to that person who has died. So those things are, are important. Um, if I could just to pass along, Lauren, some, some very practical uh, tips in, in wrapping up. Um, some positive ideas for remembering um, your loved one during this season, uh, some very practical ways. Maybe you have an empty chair present uh, or not uh, at the uh, holiday table this year, uh, sharing favorite stories about the person who died uh, with your family, with your friends. Uh, many people find lighting a candle, saying a prayer in their honor helpful. Maybe it's wrapping a favorite keepsake or a framed picture of the person who's passed and giving it as a gift to another family member. Um, there are numerous ways and you can go online to, to find out uh, how to create ornaments that uh, use the photos of your loved one, um, making a book of memorabilia or pictures about your loved one, sharing those things, creating a memory box. Many people find that helpful and having each family member write down a favorite memory and read it aloud and then put it in the box. And, and creating a memory box is also a good way that you can add to it each year if you like. Um, if you have uh, children in your family, encourage them to draw pictures or create gifts inspired by their memories and, and share those things. Maybe it's donating a, a favorite book um, to your local library or your favorite charity, making a, a financial contribution in their name uh, to their a favorite charity or house of worship or civic or community group. Um, as someone else said, maybe it's making their favorite foods uh, this holiday season and sharing those or listening to their favorite music, um, mentioning their name at, at a prayer or at toast. A volunteering your time is so important. As we approach the holidays, there's a great need for volunteering. Um, maybe it's planting a tree in their name or putting notes in a stocking that you hang this year. Uh, having jewelry made into a new setting, or, or maybe not, maybe not. If remembering your loved one feels like it's too much this season, then focus on yourself. Those are just a few ways. 
Thank you, Howard. Thank you. As you were talking, Howard, it brought up my own thoughts about uh, ways to remember my loved ones around the holidays. Every year, my sister and I will set out our handwritten recipes from our mom and our grandma, and we use them to cook our Thanksgiving dinner. So it's a really great time to reflect and to celebrate on their lives. Um, and I know they'd be really happy that we're um, carrying on their traditions and not changing their recipes. <laughs> yes, and they would I be love it and tasty too. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it it, it really is a, it, it's a really beautiful way. So thank you for reminding us of that, Howard. Sure. Uh, Monica Escalante read in the chat box. Sometimes unexpected things hit me in ways I have not expected. New fears are emerging as we face the holidays. I wonder if I'll be able to feel joy. Will I manage seeing others share with their loved ones? Will that hurt me? How can I protect myself? Wow, is that to me? I'll, I'll answer it. Uh, <laughs> you know, grief feels like a roller coaster, you know, and, and some days are better than others. And um, sometimes you do question whether or not you are normal, whether you ever will feel joy again, uh, feelings of peace, and those truly are normal expressions of the of the grieving process. And I think as we said today, I think it's so important to allow yourself to feel those feelings and, and finding ways to express them um, in a way that's healthy for you. Um, and many people do that um, through giving back to others, uh, through activities. Um, and maybe, as Alvin said, maybe you pull yourself aside uh, this season and just have a good cry. Um, or, or maybe you decline an invitation this year because you feel like it's too emotionally taxing for you to, to be involved in that activity. Um, you have to do really what's right for you. And it really will um, improve with time. Uh, I think time has some uh, benefits to it, um, but it is a, a roller coaster and very well much will feel like a roller coaster, uh, particularly in the newness of grief, but does improve with time. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Beautiful. I'm interested to hear more about our next slide, Reeves. Tell me about that. Sure, yeah. Um, Reeves are used around the globe. They're common um, ways of, of remembering. Um, the etymology of the word reef is Old English, uh, witha, um, which means to band. And usually reefs are made from evergreens and um, many people don't realize that evergreens symbolize strength and they have resilience to last throughout the harshest winters. So I think that analogy, that metaphor is comforting to think of yourself and your connection to your loved one as something that is evergreen, something uh, that would last even throughout the most harshest of winters. This was so interesting. I did not know this history. I'll certainly look at reefs differently from here on out. Thank you, Howard. Great, thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much for these amazing tools that we have in our toolbox now for this year during the holiday season. Uh, we're getting close to the end of our webinar, but before we go, I just wanna ask all the panelists, if there's just one piece of advice or information that we should take with us from this presentation today, what would that be? Uh, Alvin, I'll start with you. Yes, yeah, sure, Lauren, and thank you. Uh, this has been such a great webinar. Uh, my piece of advice would just kind of go back to some of the things I touched on, which is one, it's absolutely okay to take a break from your grief. It's okay to feel things like joy and happiness. You know, uh, grief comes in waves, takes on many shapes. So just because you're experiencing positive emotions, it doesn't mean that you're not also grieving. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you. Wonderful piece of information. Christina, how about you? Well, for me, it's, I would like everybody to encourage to keep um, keep in mind that the anticipation of an event is more difficult than the event itself. It actually goes along with Monica Scalante's question. Um, you see, sometimes our, our minds tend to wander, right? They just go in all different directions. And we're usually thinking about the future and expecting the worst, which is really creates a lot of anxiety. Actually, that's one of the definition of, of anxiety, thinking, being in the future and expecting the worst. So, worst. so be uh, aware of your thoughts and bring yourself gently to the present moment. One example um, that I can think of is if you're washing dishes and um, just look at the plate, look, look what you have in your hands, look at the color, the shape, the curves, just 
feel the water and the soap against your skin. Those are kind of exercises that we could do to remain in the present moment. Because again, our minds can wander and, and just to bring ourselves gently to the present moment might be helpful. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Christina. And Howard, how about you? I think the, the, the parting thing that I would wanna leave with uh, those watching today is that we all have the natural capacity to move through grief. Um, it is a journey and it is an individual journey and there is no right way, there's, there's no wrong way to grieve. Um, and understanding that and being kind to yourself is so important during this season, this time of year. Um, and listening to others and ways in which uh, you can memorialize and remember and reflect upon and celebrate the life of your loved one is so vitally important. And how you do that, um, make decisions that um, are right for you and are right for your loved ones um, in conversations with them. And, and be encouraged, be encouraged in knowing that one day you are going to emerge from what feels like a very desolate winter right now, you, you will you will be able to emerge from it. Be encouraged in knowing that. Beautiful. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Thank all three of you so much for being here today. You've been a wonderful group of panelists. I want to remind everyone that Coastal Hospice provides free grief support groups, programs, and memorial gatherings. We have a coping with the holidays one day support group coming up on Saturday, November 19th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. that Christina will be leading. So be sure to visit our website for more information on that. I want to once again just thank all of our panelists, Alvin Harmon, Christina Puig Lugo, and Reverend Howard Travers Jr. for this presentation on a topic that I know may be relative, relevant for many. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today. You've been a fantastic audience. We hope that this information was useful to you. To wrap things up, we ask you to take a couple of minutes to fill out this short survey. It's only five simple questions. Your feedback will help us to bring relevant programs to you, your practice, and to those you care for. When you click leave the meeting, you will receive a survey from Zoom. We will also send you the link to the survey and a follow-up email to you. This was a presentation from the Coastal Caregiver Academy, supporting and empowering caregivers in the community. At Coastal Hospice, we are here for you, and you can call us at any time on the number on the screen. Thank you once again for joining us. I am Lauren Blair. Have a wonderful rest of your day.